Okay, welcome back. Uh, today we are going to talk about parametric and non-parametric function approximators. So, uh, if you recall from the previous lecture, uh, parametric function classes are the ones where you have uh, you have a set of parameters that um, uniquely defines the function globally. So, there are many different ways you could uh, parameterize a set of functions. So, in the previous lecture, we talked about uh, if you want to approximate CAB, you can put <coughs> pick fx to be um, theta 1 or theta 0, theta 1, theta 2, transpose x raised to 0, x raised to 1, x raised to 2. Okay, so you started with some function, the value x. And you you tran you transformed it into a vector with x raised to zero as its first element, x raised to one as its second element, x raised to two as its third element, and then the parameters are theta naught, theta one, theta two, and then based on x i and z i pairs, i equals one to n, you formulate an optimization problem min over theta of some optimization and you get the value of theta star or theta hat and then you define your f hat of x to be let me make it theta hat theta hat transpose x0 x1 x2 <coughs> x square so this becomes your parameterized uh, um, uh, this is your parameterized approximate function that approximates the data. Okay. So, what different types of uh, uh, parameterizations do people usually use in reinforcement learning? So, let's first talk about linearly parameterized function class using, using basis functions. Uh, the idea here is you define some basis function so you have the state space s um, you have the action space a uh, let's define my x to be uh, s cross a so in, if you want to define a linearly parameterized function class then you use f of x theta as summation of theta i phi i x i equals 1 to n where phi i is a function from x to r <coughs> okay so this is also written as phi x uh, transpose should it be transpose yeah phi x transpose theta where phi x phi 1 x phi n x <coughs> so this is the way to parameterize the function f x theta and then again you use uh, whatever x i z i samples to um, get an optimal value of theta in order to um, uh, approximate the value function or the q function using f now one of the ideas that has been around for a long time is if your function is not performing well if your function is not fitting well to the data you could do basis expansion which is add some more um, uh, phi i's to your basis set so let's say you picked uh, so let's assume again the polynomial case so your x is r and your phi i x is x raised to i and uh, you tried 
से एफ ऑफ एक्स थीटा यू ट्राइट समेशन ऑफ और थीटा जीरो प्लस थीटा वन एक्स प्लस थीटा टू एक्स स्क्वायर एंड यू ट्राई टू फिट द डेटा एंड द डेटा डिड नॉट फिट did not fit well which means that your least square when, whenever you solve the minimization problem your the minimum value was very high which means that the data did not fit the function you had then you can add uh, more functions more basis functions and typically you would add basis function based on the intuition about the problem so you may try theta 0 plus theta 1 x plus theta 2 x square plus theta 3 log of x plus theta 4 e raised to x plus theta 5 sin of x right so you can do some sort of basis expansion which is if your initial hypothesis function doesn't seem to be fitting the data well then you can add some other basis functions so that you can better fit the data okay sometimes when you're doing image processing and stuff and x is perhaps a million dimensional vector then the uh, basis functions usually appear in the form of features which is how many edges would does the image have how many um, uh, different shapes image has and based on that you define so those are the basis functions so you in in an image if x were an image you can have c1 of x equals to number of lines or edges c2 of x equals to orientation of lines slash edges etc okay or if you are text if x was a text input so your state space is basically the space of all sentences or all paragraphs or all words then p1x could be number of specific word words in the text c2 of x would be some uh uh what else active voice slash passive voice and so on right so you can based on the input data you can determine some other uh, functions basis functions and you can use those basis functions in order to approximate the value function or the q function okay so that's the idea of uh, linearly parameterized function classes where your parameters gets multiplied linearly with the with the set of basis functions that you've defined for that problem okay so this is the parameter theta this is the basis set of basis functions and theta appears gets multiplied linearly with the set of basis functions let's talk about neural network next which is something that you are all familiar with so what i'm going to do here is just uh, Uh, quickly talk about some of the theoretical results on function function approximation properties of neural network so neural network is of course a parameterized function approximator once these parameters or the weights of these um weights of these uh, networks are fixed then in that case uh, it's uniquely defines a function over the entire space input space okay so what do we know about the function approximating properties of neural network so let's define what is known as modulus of continuity of function f and this function is from 0 1 to d to r so this uh, omega f of delta is given by supremum over fx minus fx prime uh, where x x prime is 0 1 raised to d and x and x prime are at most delta apart so if you this is your state space this is your 0 1 raised to d and you pick two prime two x and x prime that are very close to each other uh, at most delta apart 
you want to look at the supremum of the difference in the function values at these two points. Okay, that is known as the modulus of continuity. So the first result that I want to talk about, which has been um, shown rather recently, is if you have a continuous function f from r to r o. I have to tell you that this uh, these are from notes of Professor Matus Telgarski um, from UIUC. He's a expert in neural networks and um, a good friend of mine. So we have a continuous function f from r to r and let delta be a strictly positive number. Then there exists a function g that is output from a neural network. So w2 sigma. So sigma is the uh, the sig the uh, what is called activation function of the perceptron of the hidden layer. And then this is w1 is the weight and then b1 is the bias. So there exists a function g which can be written in the form of this of width <clears throat> 1 over delta. So width means how many how many uh, uh, perceptrons you have in the hidden layer. So that's the width. So of width order of 1 over delta with sigma z. So the perceptron model is uh, or the activation function is indicator of z greater than equal to 0 which is a threshold gate called the threshold gate function. So the threshold gate function is 0 and then 1. <clears throat> this is indicator function z greater than equal to 0 as a function of z. <clears throat> so that f minus g um, is less than equal to omega f delta. This uh, norm u I think is the infinity norm, but I'm not very sure. So this is perhaps the infinity norm. Um, so there exists a function g such that which can be represented by a neural network of width o1 over delta, which can approximate the function f, uh, which is a function from r to r. Okay, and this approximation depends on the modulus of continuity of the function f. Now, if you want to use the ReLU model, which is uh, this sort of activation function, so this activation function looks like this. This is the ReLU of z. This is z. Uh, then there is an, there is another neural network again of width one over delta, such that um, f prime minus g prime, or the derivative of the functions, is less than or equal to omega f delta, as well as the difference in the function is also less than or equal to omega f and delta, omega f of delta, so modulus of continuity. So somehow modulus of continuity encodes the function approximating property of the uh, neural network. <clears throat> now what do we know? So this is of course uh, of finite width. So here remember this is for finite width. So uh, the width is of the order of 1 over delta. So what happens if you allow the width to grow to infinity? So this is the most general result available for those situations. It's a paper by Leshno et al. Uh, with this title, Multilayer Feed Forward Networks with Non-Polynomial Activation Function Can Approximate Any Function. So I think this paper is from 1993. And the main result there is let sigma be a function which is not polynomial. So sigma can be anything except for polynomial. Okay, so the activation function can be anything except polynomial. Then set uh, sigma n to be the span of sigma w transpose x plus theta. w is in Rn, theta is in R. Okay, then sigma n is dense in Crn. So Crn is space of continuous function with bounded support. So you can approximate any function with bounded support uh, if sigma is not an algebraic polynomial. <coughs> okay, so that's the most general uh, uh, function approximation result we have. Now, one thing you should note is that in this situation, the number of uh, 
hidden layers could be infinity so number of activations in hidden layer can be infinity so that's a that's the drawback of neural network with a single um, depth that you can approximate any function any uh, continuous function using a uh, neural network of uh, depth one with with only one hidden layer but then the number of perceptrons in the hidden layer needs to be uh, very very large in order to approximate the function very well okay and it doesn't matter what sigma you pick as long as it is non polynomial you are good <clears throat> now let's talk about multiple hidden layers so when you have multiple hidden layers then uh, then of course the parameterization is the weights here the weights here and the weights here those are the parameterization and for this class of algorithms for this class of networks it is better able to approximate a continuous function so let's look at the theorem again this is from the notes of professor max uh, from professor mato stelgarsky from uiuc so if you have a continuous function f and delta is greater than 0 and sigma is a relu function relu activation function then there exists g gx okay so g is uh, w3 sigma w2 sigma w1 x plus b1 with width o of d over delta raised to d so this is o of d over delta raised to d with f minus g1 is the integral the l1 norm between f and g uh, f minus g that is less than equal to 2 omega f delta so this is the modulus of continuity <clears throat> okay so again you see that there, the number of uh, perceptrons in the hidden layer has to be very very large in order for you to get a much better approximation of the function f okay uh, uh, and also this function f is from rd or maybe 0 1 raised to d to r okay so even multi layer perceptrons are much much better so so this is this is of course a theoretical result but what we know from practice is multi layer perceptrons is much much better to so even with fewer number of perceptrons it is better able to approximate arbitrary continuous functions okay so that's perhaps one reason why deep neural networks have become so important in the recent past because it can really approx it has a much better approximation property and with very few parameters it is able to remarkably approximate a very large class of continuous functions particularly that would be useful in practice <clears throat> now the next topic is a, a slightly a complicated topic so it is known as a reproducing kernel hilbert space uh, the the the, the if you want to understand this in full generality then you need to have some background in um, functional analysis but because I don't expect you to know functional analysis I'm just going to give you an introduction from finite dimensional perspective uh, and then I will move on to the function space uh, in the next uh, few minutes okay so let's try to build the intuition for finite dimensions so I pick a positive definite matrix Q okay so q can be written in this particular fashion where vi is uh, vi is the eigen vector lambda i is the eigen value and since we know that q is positive definite eigen value has to be real and positive and vi's are going to be mutually orthogonal and i'm going to assume that vi transpose vi is equal to 1 so in some sense the l2 norm of vi is is unity q inverse can be written in this fashion so the proof is not very difficult but you can perhaps convince yourself let's try to do it well no let's not try to do it okay so q now I'm going to define the inner product between x and y in this particular fashion so x y the inner product between x and y 
is x transpose q inverse y, which is given by summation of ai bi over lambda i, where ai equals to x transpose vi and then bi equals to y transpose uh, vi. Okay. Um, now, you would argue that typically you know that the inner product in real line you have heard is x transpose y, but it turns out that inner product satisfies these three properties which I have picked from Wikipedia. Um, so you can take a look at it. So what are the properties that inner product satisfies? So inner product is supposed to satisfy these three properties and as you can see, if Q is positive definite, then this inner product, this definition of inner product satisfies all these three properties and therefore is a valid inner product on Rn. Okay. So, uh, so what is the reproducing kernel property? So if I define the inner product between x and y in this particular fashion, then it has the following property. Let's let qi be the ith column of q okay if you take x inner product with qi then this is exactly equal to xi so this is the reproducing kernel property of um, this particular space so the space rn endowed with this inner product reproducing kernel property property of Rn with this inner product. Now, if you change the, uh, it, 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 it holds for any positive definite matrix Q. Okay, so pick a positive definite matrix Q, you have come up with a completely new uh, inner product space, and that inner product space will have, it, it's actually, an, it will actually be a Hilbert space, and that space will have this property that if you multiply X it take the inner product between x and the ith column of the q matrix then you will get exactly equal to xi so let's see why this should be the case okay it's not very difficult to see x qi is x transpose q inverse qi so let me stack them in the form of a row vector x qi x q1 xq2, xqn, this is equal to x transpose q inverse q1, x transpose q inverse qn, x transpose q inverse q, which is exactly equal to x transpose. Okay, so that's why this is x1, this is x2, this is x3, and so x. Uh, multiplied by qi is equal to xi. So this is known as the reproducing kernel property of this inner product space and the the only property that I've used here um, is the fact that q is a positive definite matrix and I've defined the inner product in this particular fashion. Okay, so th those are the two properties that I've used. Now, <clears throat> since uh, now let's try and extend this to the uh, infinite dimensional state space. So, what is the notion of uh, an inner product? Sorry, what is the notion of a, a positive definite matrix in infinite dimensional space? So, well, if you look at the space of functions from R n to R then uh, these are the these are the different kernels that people have studied in the past uh, so these are known as kernels so uh, q was a positive definite matrix is now replaced with this kernel replaced with positive definite kernel and the kernel is given by these expressions so you can view q 
as a function from 1 to n cross 1 to n to r right so you can view q as a function and so q of i comma j equals to q i j okay that's why it, it was in the form of a matrix and now here so this 1 to n was my space uh, x in that situation now i'm going to use k as a kernel from x cross x to r and it should have some <coughs> positive definiteness property which I won't go into because that requires you to understand Hilbert spaces but nonetheless you should know that these kernels the way these kernels are defined k of x y uh, they all satisfy those positive definiteness property in infinite dimensional spaces or in the function spaces okay so the idea of uh, reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces is that if you try to minimize some loss function between z i and f of x i uh, for the data set that you have uh, and you want to minimize it with respect to some parameter theta which defines the function f let me write it explicitly okay so it turns out that you can actually pick f of xi comma theta as summation of theta i k of x comma xi i equals 1 to n so you pick some n arbitrary points uh, from your training sample uh, you define your parameterized function f in this particular fashion so summation of theta i multiplied by k x comma x i and then you try to fit the function the loss function whatever that loss function may be you try to figure out by solving this optimization problem you find try to find the optimal value of theta that minimizes the overall loss okay so this is the RKHS uh, uh, so this kind of function approximating meeting property is inherited by RKHS. Okay, there are a lot of good books about reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces. You can just uh, look up online and find a lot of books written on this topic because it's been studied for a long time. I think since 1930s or maybe 40s. So, um, so you can pick any of these kernels. So let's say you want to pick tan hyperbolic of x y minus theta, uh, which is precisely the multi-layer perceptron uh, kernel. Then you can pick. So let's say let's say this is the kernel you want to pick. Then you can you can I don't know you just pick some endpoints from your state space x and then you define your f of x comma theta as summation of theta i k x comma x i i equals 1 to n so summation i equals 1 to n theta i tan hyperbolic x transpose x i minus Oh, this is also using theta. I have to change it to some other, some other variable. Uh, uh, let me write it as alpha. Uh, no, alpha is also used. Uh, beta i. <coughs> okay. Now you have to. Now actually, this f is now a function of beta as well. So I need to introduce that as well so okay so now fx f is a function of x theta and beta and you need to find optimal theta and beta uh, in order to um, in order to uh, approximate the original uh, in order to fit the data basically fit the regression problem fit the data of the regression problem all right um, uh, 
since this is a reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces, so you can uh, uh, it it turns out that this class of functions has this uh, so functions defined in this particular way has the property that it spans the entire space. So therefore, any function within the reproducing kernel Hilbert space can be approximated in this particular fashion. Now, of course, you will the more number of n, the num more number of samples x1 to xn you pick. So let's say a, 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 your n was 1 million, the better the function approximating property would be. But of course, your computational complexity will also become significantly higher. So uh, so there is always a trade-off between how complex you want your function approximating class to be and how complex you want your computations to be. So there is a very special class of RKHS which are known as radial basis functions where your k of x comma y is actually dependent on some function of norm of x minus y. And I think typically this is 2 norm, uh, sorry 2 norm. Uh, but I'm not sure if somebody has looked at other norms as well or not. But but I have seen two norms pretty much everywhere. So I just don't know if uh, you can put any other norm in this particular situation. So there are a lot of different kernel functions that people have looked at, Gaussian, multi-quadratic, inverse quadratic, and so on. <coughs> Some of these kernels were also given in the previous uh, thing. So I think Gaussian kernel was there. Let me show it to you. So this is the Gaussian kernel radial basis function. Uh, this is the inverse multi-quadratic radial basis function. This is also multi-quadratic ra radial basis function. Uh, thin plate splines and then uh, these two are, both of them are thin plate splines uh, functions. So these are all uh, given here as well. Okay, <clears throat> so the rest of the theory remains the same. Your f of x comma theta would be summation of theta i phi of norm of x minus x i to norm i equals 1 to n. So that's how you are going to approximate your function over the entire space. Okay, so let's move on to decision and regression tree where uh, the idea is actually very simple. So let's say, uh, before we jump on to this particular lemma, let's say, let's consider a specific problem. So I have this uh, space R2 and I have a function f that maps x to sine of x1, x2. So what does this uh, do? So in this region, the function value is plus 1. In this region, the function value is plus 1. And then in this region, the function value is minus 1. In this region, the function value is minus 1. And you want to approximate this function. How are you going to do it? Well, it turns out that this is a discontinuous function. So technically, it's a measurable function. But unfortunately, there is no way to uh, approximate it very well using some of the earlier function approximating classes that we talked about partly because all of those function approximating classes were continuous, were for continuous functions. So now the goal is to extend some of that. Uh, uh, so so the, the idea here is to come up with a way to approximate discontinuous functions. <coughs> and one of the simplest ways to do it using regression or decision tree. So let's uh, give you, let me show you by example how trees are conduct, con constructed. So you, <coughs> so, so you start with a yes no question. So is x1 greater than 0? If, if the answer is yes, then you go through this particular leaf and then you ask another question is x2 greater than 0? Yes, then you give it a value of 1. Is x2 less than 0? No, you give it a value of negative 1 and same thing. Yes, no, negative 1, 1. Okay. So now if you give a give me an input x, I'm going to go through this tree and I'm going to sell so I'm going to define the function f hat of x as the 
I'm going to go through the tree and whatever is the terminal value I get at terminal value in the tree. So if you give me 3, 5, I'm going to ask the first question is 3 greater than 0, yes. Is 5 greater than 0, yes. And then I'm going to define the value of function f at x as equal to 1 and so on. Right. So, <clears throat> so that's the, that's known as, this is known as a tree, uh, a regression tree or a decision tree uh, because of the way it looks like, it looks like a tree. Like tree is a very uh, well studied uh, object in computer science. So this looks like a tree and therefore it is known as a regression tree or a decision tree. So what's the <coughs> function approximating property for decision or regression tree? So continuous f from rd to r delta greater than 0 is given for any partition p of 0, 1, d into rectangles, so product of intervals. So <coughs> more generally, you can write a decision tree in this particular fashion. x1 is in a, comma b, x2 is in c, comma d, x3 is in e, comma f, and so on, right? So So what you get is a partition P of 0, 1, D into rectangles, product of intervals, uh, with all side lengths not exceeding delta, then there exist scalars alpha 1 to alpha n such that F minus H in the soup norm is less than equal to omega F delta, where H is given by alpha i uh, and the indicator function over R i. So so ri is the rectangle and within that rectangle if your x is in that rectangle then the value of the function is equal to alpha i so pictorially this is my <coughs> 0 1 raised to d is i am going to define it divide it into very fine rectangles uh, actually, the rectangles need not look like this. So, let me try to <coughs> come up with arbitrary rectangles. <clears throat> okay, so this is what my, so I have divided my entire region 0, 1 to D in the form of uh, several rectangles. Uh, this can be <clears throat> traversed using a decision tree of this sort. Of course, the decision tree for this particular uh, function is going to look very complicated. So if you give me a continuous function, I can come up with such a tree where each of these uh, uh, length is less than delta, less than delta, and uh, I'm going to uh, keep the value of the function constant within each of these rectangles. So there, uh, the, the value of the function in this rectangle is alpha 1, here it's alpha 2, here is alpha 3, alpha 4, and so on. <clears throat> and this function is going to approximate the function, the continuous function f uh, with the uh, uh, norm being away, with the norm being bounded by omega f of delta. <clears throat> so this is uh, the theory of, so what are the parameters here? The parameters would be a, b, c, d, e, f and all these values, these intervals. So the endpoint of the intervals would be the parameters and that's what would be the parameterization for any function f that is written in the form of a decision tree or a regression tree. <clears throat> and this again has the property of being able to um, approximate any continuous function. In fact, it also can approximate discontinuous functions of very special type. Now, sometimes again, you may need to have basis, you may need to do basis expansion in order to be able to um, uh, approximate functions that are slightly more complicated. So 
let me give you an example I'll make it full screen so let's say you have a function which is okay so this is your x1 this is my x2 uh, this is plus 1 and everything below it is minus 1 and this particular curve the or the brown curve is x1 x2 is equal to 1 so if you are above x1 x2 then your value is plus 1 if you are below x1 x2 then your value is minus 1 now again the problem is how do you know um, how would you do this using the regression tree well you get x which is x1 x2 you transform it into y which is x1 x2 and x1 x2 and then you try to form a decision tree with y so with x you won't be able to form a decision tree to approximate this function but with y you can actually find that function exactly which is y3 greater than 1 the value is 1 y3 less than 1 the value is 0 or oh sorry I think minus 1 <clears throat> so this is a way to so through basis expansion so this is the basis expansion part so with basis expansion you are able to approximate the function a discontinuous function very well using a decision tree so that's also a something you should keep in mind now how these the decision tree is con constructed and how it is trained um, there are many algorithms to do that so I guess I'm not going to go into that uh, if you're interested in learning more about it you should definitely pick up a book on machine learning or a uh, book on uh, uh, or, or you can read papers on re reinforcement learning with decision tree or regression tree and you will be able to find some algorithms to um, to come up with the parameters that would define the tree and would approximate the function the value function or the q function very well <clears throat> So this ends the discussion on parametric function approximators. In the next class, we'll talk about non-parametric function approximators and randomized function approximators.